My name is Porter Collier. I'm 80 and a half years old on this day. Uh, the, uh, what I want to talk about today is my military career. Uh, my uh, wife, uh, Lillian, and I got married and I was still in medical school and uh, they had a program at that time that you could go on active duty and be in medical school and I was an ensign in my senior year uh, in medical school. Uh, I then, uh, after I got out of medical school and did my internship, I was uh, became a flight surgeon uh, by going through the Flight Surgery Training Command uh, at uh, Pensacola, Florida. And uh, when I soloed down there, I can still see the look on that instructor's face because he thought I was going to crash. So did I, but he, uh, I, I think he probably, I probably aged him by at least 10 years. Uh, the uh, the uh, I then went aboard the uh, USS Essex, which was a straight deck carrier converted to an angle deck. Uh, it is now on the bottom of the Pacific as a reef. Um, I uh, then uh, became a resident in orthopedic surgery at the Naval Hospital in Portsmouth, Virginia. Uh, and I uh, finished there and uh, went to uh, uh, Vietnam. Uh, as an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, to get to Vietnam, uh, we were flying on uh, American Airlines planes to Okinawa, and then the military uh, took us on their aircraft from uh, Okinawa to uh, Da Nang, uh, and uh, which is where I was for a month. I was uh, the commanding officer of a, uh, a marine medical company, uh, which is interesting because I had no con command experience at all. I didn't even know what a captain's mast was. Uh, to this day, so many years later, I remember the look on that Marine Gunny's face when he said, Doc, you got to hold a captain's mast. And I said, Gunny, what are you talking about? And he uh, uh, wanted to laugh. I said, go on and laugh at me and then tell me. And that's what he did. And then I said, now what am I supposed to do? He said, just restrict him to his barracks for two weeks. That's all you got to do. And that's what I did. We then went up to uh, Fubai, uh, which is where the 3rd Marine Division was actually uh, there, and uh, again, that was 150 miles north, and we went up in a, in a uh, caravan, and uh, me not knowing what we were into up there, I uh, slept and then overnight on top of the uh, ambulance, uh, which uh, the Marine gunnies uh, didn't want us to do, of course, but we just went ahead and did it anyway. Uh, they, thought, they thought we might get shot. Uh, when I uh, got to Fubai, uh, I uh, became the, uh, the uh, CO of a company, uh, a, a medical company, uh, 3rd Marine Division, and was in charge of the hospital uh, in Fubai. Uh, now, a few stories about that. Uh, the, uh, the operating rooms were in Quonset huts, and we did not have any uh, uh, hot water to scrub our hands with to cut down on infection. There was a CB battalion right next door to us, and the CB chief would come over every once in a while and say, do you guys need anything? And I said, yeah, chief, we sure could use a, um, some, a hot water so we could scrub our hands to cut down on infection. He says, well, I don't think it can help you. He comes back about a week later and he says, now you're going to hear a lot of hammering and nailing going on up in that operating room tonight. Do not come up there. Well, I by that time found out who really gets things done in the military and that's the senior enlisted guys. And so I did what I was told and I didn't come up there. About two o'clock in the morning he comes and gets me and um, there's hot water. He says, now when the Marines come by you throw this switch, there's no hot water. And I said, Chief, where'd you get that hot water heater? He said, you don't want to know. I said, yeah, Chief, I do want to know too. He's turned around and started to walk off. And he said, well, I'm not going to tell you, Doc, but I will tell you this. The general had two hot water heaters. Now he's only got one. That's what we called in Vietnam, Kong Shaw. And that's where we got most of our stuff. Uh, now, the other uh, story I want to tell you uh, is that how, uh, uh, small the world is because 
the Air Force C-130s would pull right up in front of our uh, uh, hospital, and then the Marines would have to load the casualties board where the Air Force nurses and pilots and all stood off to the side uh, and uh, waited until we got them on board, and then they took over. And I was out there in a, with no shirt on, it was hotter than heck, and um, this Marine almost dropped this guy. Well, I'd been there for about six months, and I spoke Marine language, you know, four-letter words quite well. And I spoke to him in some language that he would understand, and all of a sudden, here comes this uh, Air Force pilot uh, out of the group over there, and he walks up to me and he says, Hi, Porter. And I said, Who the are you? He raised his hat. Here's Spencer Allen, a guy I'd been in college with. And uh, he also saved my brother Lacey's rear end, too, later on. Uh, and that's the next thing. Christmas Day, and I, I think it was 69, but I'm not sure. Um, there was a knock on the door, and uh, there was my brother. He was on the uh, Navy pilot on the USS Saratoga, and Lacey had taken two weeks' leave to come ashore and spend it with me while the Saratoga went back to Japan to resupply. Uh, he spent two weeks. Uh, with me and uh, went out on submarine uh, helicopter things and that kind of thing. And he had been an up and coming uh, guy, meaning an admiral's aide, etc. Uh, was in a commander's billet as a lieutenant commander. Uh, but when he got back aboard the boat, he said, Let's either win this war or get the heck out of here. Uh, and he never got promoted again. He spent his last eight years teaching helicopter pilots in Pensacola. But anyway, he, he went down to Da Nang to get uh, a plane back to uh, Japan where he could get back on the Saratoga. But they uh, were allowed, they, the Navy pilots had their own weapons and he had a 38 caliber pistol that he put in a uh, shoulder holster. And when he got down there to get on the plane, they said, you can't take that weapon out of here. Nobody can. And he says, well, either that weapon goes or I don't go. And he called me on the telephone, and I called Fincher Allen and told him, he laughed like heck, and he said, send him over to me, I'll put him on as a uh, crewman, and then we can get him over there with his weapon. And that's exactly how he got out of there, too, with that. Um, now, uh, a lot of interesting things, uh, well, let's, let me talk with you about my weapon. Uh, when I went over there, uh, we went through Camp Pendleton, and again, <laughs> I had two of my very dear friends with me, Jay Cox and Stan Harmon. We had been in residences together and uh, knew each other quite well. And of course, the, the, the Marine gunny sergeant was supposed to treat us as enlisted people, so we would know what that was like. And they did. I think they had a lot of fun with us. But the three of us, a lot of the, the guys really got upset about the way they were talked to and all that. But the rest of us just kind of laughed at them and went ahead and had some fun uh, for that. Uh, so anyway, uh, I uh, then uh, went to Vietnam, as I've already said, explained, uh, and uh, these, these people were with me. Uh, uh, neither one of them is alive now. Uh, followed me about six months with another dear friend. Um, um, Oh, come on, I, his name will come to me in a minute. Uh, he'd been one of my residents, actually. He died about two weeks ago uh, for that. So I'm about the only one that's left around out of that group of people. Uh, now, in, in coming back, uh, another uh, interesting, rather funny thing happened, actually. Uh, uh, the military got us to Okinawa and we loaded an American Airlines plane. And the way they did it is the, the, the junior Marines got on first and the senior Marines got on last. There was only three officers aboard, one of which fortunately was a uh, Marine Colonel. And when we got out, you could hear, if you remember, that war was not popular at all. And when we went into San Diego, you could, they, you could hear up in the the uh, inner parts of the um, uh, thing, all these people up there yelling baby killers and all that kind of stuff. That Marine Colonel, you could look at the, his face and you knew something was going to happen. And what he did was he went up to the tent of those stairs, 
He wouldn't let anybody, including me, get by him. And he just stood there with his arms folded. Uh, about 10 minutes, things quieted down a little bit. He didn't move, he just stood there. After about another five minutes, they left. I think those people thought he was gonna pull out some Marines and shoot them all, but I don't know. And I walked up to him and I said, Colonel, that's one of the nicest things I've ever seen. And he says, they're not gonna call my uh, guys baby killers, and he walked off. So we even had some things happen on the way back. As far as the war was concerned, uh, first of all, we should never have been there. And secondly, when we went, we should have won it. But we did not win it. We ran, just as we've run from everything in the last uh, bit of wars. Uh, we lost 54,000 people in that war, and uh, we uh, ran when we left, and the uh, uh, North Vietnamese people took over. Uh, I just think that's ridiculous, but that's kind of the way things were back in those days. Uh, um, I think that's about it as far as uh, the war was concerned. Uh, I came back to, uh, to uh, the Marines down in, uh, in North Carolina where I spent one year and then I came back to the Naval Hospital in Portsmouth because I wanted to be a, an instructor in orthopedics uh, where I, I retired in 1978 uh, uh, period. I guess that's really about it as far as the military career is concerned. Did you have any uh, questions? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I didn't know you were going to go that far into it. I thought I was going to be asking questions the whole time. <laughs> no. um, you talked about multiple people, I guess your friends that you made during your stay in the Navy. Um, and you said you're one of the last ones. All right, so no one else is alive out of all your friends that you made through the war or the Navy? Uh, the orthopedic friends. Now, there are still some uh, other specialists that were with me at the Naval Hospital that are alive, but the orthopedic friends, uh, I'm the only one that's left. Okay. Uh, what would you have changed about your war experience if you could? Well, <laughs> first of all, I wouldn't have gotten to Vietnam, but. Uh, Actually, nothing. Uh, I was very satisfied with my military experience. Uh, the, uh, I was sorry that I had to go to a war, but that was part of what I had signed up for, and I think we did very well. I, uh, I thought about this quite a lot, and there's only one person that got to us alive uh, that died when he shouldn't have. And that was just simply because of the lack of, of um, uh, the general surgeons who were doing the uh, triaging for us. We had a guy that we didn't know it at the time, but he'd come on, he'd volunteered to come on active duty. Uh, and uh, he just, this casually came in and had a little piece of shrapnel in his head, uh, his forehead. And he was going to send an Nang to the neurosurgeons, and he just set him aside with no corpsman over there watching him. Fortunately, I, well, not fortunately, but I went over there, and he was complaining of his belly. And I said, how did you get hurt? And he said, a tank blew up, and I fell off the tank and landed on my back. I said, oh my gosh, he's ruptured his spleen, which is exactly what he had done. But unfortunately, all of the operating rooms were, were uh, in use. All of the general surgeons were in use. I uh, started to get, uh, I got as much blood as I could and, and put it into him and was getting a knife and getting ready to operate on him myself, but he died uh, right there. He's the only one though, of all the casualties that got to us that um, uh, I think should have lived. Interesting. Uh, along those lines, did anything happen during the war that affected you for the rest of your life? Well, yeah, uh, just being there affected me the rest of my life. I have, uh, I, uh, as you probably know, I'm now doing physicals for the Veterans Administration, and uh, I'm getting a chance to talk to a lot of people that were in Vietnam, uh, 
some of them at the same time I was, up at Fubai, the same place I was. Now, we didn't know each other, but uh, I still talk to these people, and uh, it's just, it's nice to be able to talk about these kind of things. Uh, I've often thought, you know, and I spoke to Lillian before she passed about this, uh, I've often thought that if I uh, had my life to live over again, uh, would I go into the military like I did and do what I did? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, now, I think that uh, one of the things that uh, my daughter Linda had asked about was, what about them while I was in Vietnam? Well, uh, Lillian's aunt and uncle, Erling uh, Reese, who is the reason she came to this country, uh, was from Mobile. So she went uh, with the family down uh, to um, uh, Mobile, where she lived, uh, rented a house and lived for a year uh, while I was in Vietnam. Uh, fortunately, we had some friends, particularly from medical school, uh, Jack Green being one of them, who uh, would, would you know take, ask, ask them with the kids over to their house and take them out to dinner and that kind of thing. So uh, I don't think her year was too bad while she was waiting on me. Uh, but uh, just <laughs> when I got home, we had flown into New Orleans and um, from the West Coast. And um, uh, I got into, uh, I'd taken a bus from New Orleans uh, to Mobile and uh, then a taxi from the bus station out to the house. And I got there about uh, uh, four o'clock in the morning woke her up. I don't think she liked that too much, but anyway, that's the way it was. Uh, there is a story that I'd like to tell about acupuncture. Uh, back in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, acupuncture was considered to be uh, uh, malpractice in the United States. You could actually, if you got acupuncture and it didn't help you, that, that you could actually sue the doctor. Uh, I used to go into way to the hospital there. The uh, anesthesia people as well as the surgeons were people that had been to the United States for a year or two for their specialty. And one of the um, anesthesia doctors there was somebody I had been with in Grand Rapids, Michigan while I was taking my pediatric orthopedics. And I, what I went over there for was just to do a little minor case on a child. and. Uh, but their operating rooms were totally open. They never shut the doors or anything like that. So as I walked in there, this uh, I looked into the operating room. They were getting ready to cut on this lady, and there was a lady there with an abdomen so big, I thought she was nine months pregnant. And the anesthesia, again, was the person that I knew. And I said to him, I said, uh, what are y'all doing? I said, are you doing a C-section? Oh, no, that's a uh, fibroid. We're taking it out. And I said, where's your anesthesia equipment? I don't see any of it. He says, we don't use anesthesia equipment. We just use uh, acupuncture. I said, oh, and I turned around and walked off and went over and did my little case, which took about a half an hour. And as I came back and looked in there, they had this lady's abdomen wide open with the fibroid exposed. And she was sitting there telling jokes and laughing with the anesthesia people. And I walked up to him, I said, did you give her a spinal? And he said, no, acupuncture. Well, I came back to the States and started looking around to see if I could find anybody that did acupuncture. I don't mean for anesthesia, but for uh, pain, like back pain and all that. And I did find a person um, who had been trained by his father uh, in China and um, could do it. And in fact, he's still alive and he's still doing a little bit of it. And uh, as time has gone by, acupuncture has become more and more popular. If you go down Portsmouth Boulevard, uh, uh, I'm sorry, if you go down High Street into downtown Portsmouth, you'll find at least five or six people or places where acupuncture is done. Uh, so I learned an awful lot by going to what was considered to be a very backward com company. Uh, were you working then at all? 
no, I was not working. Uh, there really wasn't, uh, how to say this, when you're in medical school, the uh, hours that you spent in the hospital and the time studying, there was just no way you could, you could uh, work. But you see, my father actually paid my tuition and it was very expensive too. It was a whole $400 a semester. And uh, so I didn't have, and uh, then he, they were also paying for me. To, I was living in a, um, a uh, fraternity house, um, a medical fraternity house in Birmingham until we got married and then we moved into some apartments. <laughs> That's an interesting story too. Um, the apartments we moved into at one time had been uh, houses for prostitutes, and I'll never forget this. Uh, Lillian and I and, and uh, Linda were in there, and uh, about oh, 10 o'clock at night, there's a knock knock on the door, and uh, I go to open it. And there's this guy standing there and said, Are you finished? And I said, What are you talking about? And he says, uh, have, Did you have your sex? I said, What are you talking about? He says, well, I'm come over. I used to come over here all the time to have sex, and uh, that's what I've come over here for tonight. And I said, get your rear end out of here. That's not what this is. <laughs> that also is a true story. So you, you told us earlier the circumstances you joined the military was because they would pay for, did, did you say they would pay for your school? or? Yes, they paid. I was an instant. Uh, on active duty, the, uh, in my fourth year of medical school, just after Lydia and I got married. And that was, uh, I was going to, you know, in those days there was a draft. I was going to get drafted anyway, so I went ahead and joined up. Um, the, uh, I was very much ahead of my uh, time because uh, back in those days, the, the Korean War was just over. And the military was short on doctors, and they had a program which they called a, a three-four program. And what that meant is that you were in college for three years and then medical school for four, then you came on active duty. But actually, uh, I went to summer school and I was on a two-four program, so uh, I was still very young when I went into the military. Did uh, did your parents approve of you serving in the military? They didn't. Have, I mean, there was no choice. Uh, my father had been in the Army Air Force in World War II, but there really was no choice because the draft was there. We we're going to get, you had to spend two years in the draft. Gotcha. Um, and home was in Tuscaloosa, correct? Home was in Tuscaloosa until we uh, uh, moved, uh, and then Quincy Point, Rhode Island, where I was a flight surgeon. How did you feel about leaving home? You know something, Travis, that's an interesting question. I've never really even thought about it. Um, I guess I'll be honest with you. I was glad to leave home. Um, my, I was the oldest of five, and therefore everything that happened, it was my fault because I wasn't taking care of them. And, um, I was ready to leave. Um, so when you went north, you said Rhode Island, I believe? Mm -hmm. Quinston Point, Rhode Island, which the base is closed now. How did you communicate with your family, I'm assuming back in Tuscaloosa? Uh, telephone primarily. Uh, you know, I'm not a, a writer. They don't, in fact, even if I wrote it, they couldn't read it. Uh, so it was, it was primarily with the telephone, and then Lillian would, would send them a letter every once in a while to let them know what we were doing. Okay, next we're going to talk about uh, numerous vacations taken down on the Outer Banks. Um, and um, originally what we would do would be to go down there with uh, other people from the Naval Hospital. Again, uh, usually orthopedic uh, residency residences, but some other people that Lillian got to know quite well. And uh, Vinny uh, was a lady who had two houses down there. One was a garage with an apartment overhead, and that's what we usually stayed in. And then there was a huge house, a five-bedroom house next door to it. 
and she lived in Elizabeth City, and we would rent these two houses from her for uh, uh, $400 for the week, both houses. Uh, and um, at that time, uh, Mama had a, uh, a dog, Susie, and uh, these houses were right on the road, and one day Susie got out, wasn't supposed to be out, and got hit by a car, and um, just had a laceration. And uh, I sewed the dog up, but she wouldn't accept that. She took the dog all the way back to Elizabeth City to a veterinarian because there wasn't any vets down there in those days. But anyway, uh, we had a good time down there. Uh, Beth likes the story of uh, uh, when we were out in the in the in the ocean in a inflatable uh, little boat or raft or whatever it was, and. Um, uh, I would take uh, she and Jimmy uh, out in it, and uh, I think they were somewhere around four years, I think you were around about four years old, if I'm not mistaken. And then I would dive down to the bottom and talk and, and talk about how I had the conversation with Mortimer the Crab. Uh, and uh, uh, I would also uh, have uh, Linda paddle while I would uh, try to catch some bluefish with my rod reel out there. Uh, we had a good time down on the Outer Banks. Um, we kept going down there until Vinnie sold the two houses. Uh, she offered to sell them to me, and I wished she had because they were. she was only asking $20,000 at that time, but of course, being in the military, I didn't have any money. Um, however, uh, later on, I went down to the Outer Banks Medical Society meeting, which I still go to, by the way. I'm going down there again in July of this year. And uh, the way they did it is that you would have the meeting from 7 o'clock till noon and then come back at uh, 5 o'clock for the evening, and then you had all afternoon to do what you wanted to, go to the beach or whatever. And one day, it was raining like heck. And um, so we had been coming down there all these years for that, and I said to Lillian, I said, let's go see if we can find a place we can afford. And so uh, she said, well, okay, we'll go look. And we uh, uh, just drove around and looked, and we found this old place that at the time we finally ended up buying it was already 30 years old. Uh, that makes it about 80 years old right now. But anyway, the, the fellow was going to sell it, uh, the, guy, the owner was going to sell it, but the interest rates at that time were 20%. So uh, he financed it for us. Uh, we, I think we paid him $1,000 down, and we bought it for, I think it was 32000 if I'm not mistaken. And um, uh, he financed it for us. And then, of course, as soon as the rates came down, I financed it from a, uh, the bank, and we paid for it. And we still own it, as you all know. Uh, I've done a lot of the repair work down there, put in floors, etc. I've done, actually did most of it except for the, uh, the siding. It was originally a cypress uh, siding, but the, the boards were starting to rot because they'd been there so long, and we had them put in the um, aluminum siding on the sides, and we put in new windows also. It's still a wonderful place, and one of the few places in the world that I can actually relax. Okay, I want to just say a minute again about the Outer Banks, about Linda's Island down there. Um, at Oregon Inlet, we used to, uh, we had a little bitty small boat with a nine and a half horsepower engine on it. And uh, actually we ended up with a bigger boat later on, but we would, there was a, a, some islands just at the entrance to uh, Oregon Inlet. And, uh, we used to love to go out there. There was nobody there. We were all by ourselves. Uh, the water was shallow so we could get in it. There were uh, shells all over the place which we could collect. Uh, now, uh, as time goes went by, they stopped us from going out to the island because they wanted the uh, birds to nest on it, which they did do. We, we saw a lot of their nests when we were out there. So they won't let anybody on that island anymore. If they catch you out there, they arrest you. Uh, but I just wanted to mention about Linda's Island because that's what we called it, okay.